Hello friends, my name is Marines, and today I'm back with another reading project that is also a collaboration. At the beginning of the year we did a project reading the past 10 years of Goodreads Choice Award winners in a specific category and then we also did a project reading super hyped books and talking about whether or not they're overhyped and now we're back to do another project around awards reading. I will leave all of the information about the collaboration including the channels participating and the playlist to all the videos in the description below. So I decided to read for the Hugo Awards. I did this last year unofficially because I attended Worldcon and so I wanted to be an informed voter. I found that project really rewarding. I found some great books on that list so I had in my head that I was going to do it again this year anyways. So very true to form, I'm incredibly late on starting this reading project. <laughs> uh, it's not the day before. <laughs> you will be happy to know. Like I've been thinking about this for weeks and weeks and weeks but a couple of things happen. One is that I've been searching for a job for the past five months and I've been like incredibly consumed and stressed out by this job search and you will not be surprised to find that I'm starting this like the day after I signed an offer letter so I officially have an offer I'll be starting work in a couple of weeks so I have some of that weight off my shoulders now I'm still like really really worried about like budgeting and whatnot because I was not working for five months but at least the stress of like looking for a job is gone and and that has helped tremendously so you know here I am like oh okay <laughs> I can make a video now uh, so that's one and two is that I saw the nominated like novels and novellas and I had read some of them last year I had read none of them so I feel like I created this false sense of security in my head where I was like oh I've read a bunch of these that's great but looking back at this list I'm like hmm <laughs> I probably should have started a little earlier but you know I don't count myself out I can do amazing things under the gun so the works nominated for best novel are The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Sylvia Marina Garcia The Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi Nona the Ninth by Tamsin Muir Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher and The Spearman by Mary Robinette Kowal we're gonna do it in the order I just read it because that's the way my brain works starting with The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Sylvia Marina Garcia I actually I actually already read this. I read it for How Salt earlier this year and while I don't intend to reread all of the things that I've already read, I do want to reread this book specifically. I think one because it doesn't live very strongly in my memory and I want to be able to compare it to my other reading experiences and two, I think rereading will help jumpstart this project for me. I'm gonna go do that and I'll be back with an update. Lots of good news, bad news for you. So bad news, I'm even more against the clock here. I didn't get as much reading done as I want to do this weekend. Good news is that I'm still unemployed for the next week and so I have like nothing to do except for be home and read. Good news is that I did read two books on this list plus I had a third that I had already read so I have three books to talk to you about in this clip. Bad news is that I forgot that one of the books on this list is part of a series and I've read none in that series. First of all I did reread Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Sylvia Marina Garcia. This this is an adult genre blended story that is a reimagining of the island of Dr. Moreau. We follow Carlota Moreau who is the only daughter of a mad scientist and they are living in this estate in Mexico isolated from the world around them as Dr. Moreau is creating these human animal hybrids. At the very beginning Dr. Moreau hires a new overseer for his property and we also follow his point of view as he comes to live on this estate and get to know these hybrids and as he deals with his own tragic past. As much as rereading this was a little bit of a waste of time that I don't have, I'm ultimately glad I did because I really could not remember a lot of the details about this book and I had like a vague memory of my feelings about it but I was a little bit convinced that I would enjoy this more on reread and I think I appreciated certain aspects of it more on reread but my original feelings really stand. Sylvia Moreno Garcia is one of my favorite authors currently writing. Even when her books don't land for me they're still really in this like 3, 3.5 star range because I just appreciate her undertakings. I love her writing. I think she's usually very evocative and she is great about engaging the senses through her writing and I also love the lane that she's in. Even as she kind of 
dips in and out of genres, which I think that she's one of the writers most capable of doing that currently writing. She is still like very firmly in this place where she is taking well-loved stories and tropes and dipping into genres. And she's bringing to these stories a fresh point of view simply by rooting them in Mexican history and folklore and in themes and explorations at the heart of Latine culture and history. That all said, The Daughter of Dr. Moreau is probably one of my least favorite Sylvia Moreno Garcia books that I've read so far. I think what this does well is typically what Moreno Garcia does well. This was evocative, especially in its descriptions of the setting. I felt like I understood the place and the map of where we were. It was very atmospheric and I thought that it brought these themes of colonization and racism and eugenics very well into the story of Dr. Moreau. Unfortunately, it felt like that really took the forefront and what suffered were the characterizations. I really found myself wanting more out of these characters. They felt really tied to their archetypes and tropes and it made them feel a little flat for me, a little one note. I was getting frustrated with both our point of view characters because I wanted them to do more or say more or to get out of like the same things that they were repeating over and over again. For Carlota it was this naivety that she has which again I understand and I think it made for a good conflict within the story but as she kept repeating to us that like she was falling in love, falling in love, I was kind of like I wanted to shake her and I don't think that that frustration was necessarily part of the point. I think it was a result of repetition in some ways that this character didn't feel fully formed. For Montgomery we are stuck in the cycle of his own tragedy and grief and the ways that he thinks about it. He has this thing where he writes letters to his estranged wife like in his own head and so that tool also became a little bit repetitive and he's stuck in the smire of his tragedy which again I understand and it suits the work but it was repeated so much that it got a little bit annoying to me. As I said Marina Garcia's work has a tendency to genre blend and this is a story that is science fiction but it feels very historical as well because we're in 19th century Mexico and I think it wanted to play a little bit with horror and there were some things that were on the light end of body horror and one moment in particular that was like really creepy and stressful and I wish it had leaned into that a little bit more, leaned into more of the like thrills and the horror in order to better pace this. So there were elements that I appreciated. There were some ways where I wish we had a fuller plot and fuller characters and so overall I would still give this like a three out of five stars. After that I actually started and finished pretty much between last night and this morning which is why I didn't even record the update before I announced this was next but I read The Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. This is set during the COVID pandemic. We follow our character Jamie Gray who is working at a food delivery job because they lost their job right at the start of COVID until they make a delivery to an old acquaintance who says that he actually has a job that Jamie might be interested in. There's a lot of secrecy around this job. All Tom really tells Jamie is that it is about animal preservation and that Jamie will be working as kind of like a grunt and it turns out that the job is not even really on our earth but on an alternate earth and it is in fact working with these huge dinosaur like creatures. At the end of this book Scalzi has an author's note and he talks about writing another book or attempting to write another book during the pandemic and how it wasn't working and how like the state of the world and then following that the election and the insurrection really created a place where he wasn't able to focus enough to write the story that he was working on and so when he scrapped that novel what came to him next was Kaiju Preservation Society and he calls this book a pop song. He wanted it to be fun essentially and a little more easily consumable and I think that that is a fair and accurate description of this story. I enjoy Scalzi. I've really enjoyed some of his work. I really loved Fuzzy Nation and Old Man's War. This story to me was fine. It, it was good even but it wasn't like anything amazing to me and I'm unclear how much of the story will actually stay with me. The entire focus here is on the conceit and sort of this like witty banter that happens between the characters and that really stands in for a lot of the characterization that you don't even have much room for in the story because it is rather short. Unfortunately all of the characters end up sounding the same to me and I didn't have a ton of investment in any of them. I just felt like I was being talked at 
for the duration of it, which I know is probably a funny way to describe a book because that is kind of what narration is, but I felt it here. Like I was either being told very important information or just having these people have this like very one note banter over and over again. I enjoyed the premise of it a lot. I would actually love to see an adaptation of this. I don't know that you would be able to do it, but I would love to see it. I do think that it was very on the nose and like referential in some ways. There were a lot of references to like movies and science fiction and even tropes in science fiction in a way that sometimes was funny and entertaining, but sometimes made me eye roll a little bit. I was like, okay, calm down. <laughs> okay. I like, I'm sitting here thinking that I would also probably give this like a three out of five stars, which makes me feel like my rating for Daughter of Dr. Moreau is a little low. So maybe Daughter of Dr. Moreau is like 3.25, 3.5 out of five stars. And this one is like a true three. It is like the definition of a middle of the road book for me. Like it, it was fine. It was good. It's fine. <laughs> Next up on the list is a book that I have already read and I have no intention of rereading and that is Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. I also read this as part of How Salt originally, just like Daughter of Dr. Moreau. I was pretty much the only one on the live show that didn't like this. And this has only gotten worse in my feelings and in my memories. Legends and Lattes follows Viv, an orc barbarian who is hanging up their sword. They are ready to retire from that life. And their next mission is opening a coffee shop in a place that doesn't even know what coffee is. And essentially we follow her through opening this coffee shop, forming connections in the community and with the people who ultimately help her run this coffee shop. I wanted to like this a lot more than I did. And it's not because I don't like cozy stories. And it's not because I don't understand that the point of this was to be low stakes. But to me, I had an issue with the stakes, not because they were low, but because it kept introducing stakes that it was doing nothing with. Like it would tell us like these things were happening or these things were important or introducing problems and then just letting them sort of like fizzle out or dealing with them in a way that it was like, why even, why even bring that up? Like it was very frustrating. And the thing that is supposed to be at the forefront here is really like this found family, this connection between the characters but to me that felt very dry it didn't truly feel like a found family to me during the live show I think somebody called it found co-workers and that is exactly the vibe assembling these workers and just like watching them work in their day-to-day -day, which wasn't quite the coziness that I want to read about is like people doing their nine to five I also found a lot of the details of the world building were really distracting to me like we have this coffee shop nobody knows what coffee is and their baker is creating all of these treats that have real world counterparts and some of them have like fantasy names that are made up for this book and some of them are just called the thing that they're called to us and I was like why is this happening like the detail felt so phoned into me and the fact of the matter is that it could be because if you like mention any of this most people are just gonna respond well it's cozy so like whatever as if like it being cozy is an excuse for it not to actually consider the pieces of the story that that made this up. This was also very referential. Another thing that I hear from people who love this is usually that they are D&D fans and so this kind of spoke to them but again it became referential in a way that was kind of annoying where like being in on the joke was the point. It gave me a similar feeling to Ready Player One which I will admit had like 87 million more references than this did but it's that same sort of like just having the reference is the point not incorporating it not bringing your audience into it it's just like I named this thing that you know and I know and that wasn't fun for me the last thing I really did enjoy about this were the colonizer vibes like this entire idea of Viv bringing coffee to the masses like that has a real enough touch point <laughs> to real life when you think about like the production and distribution of coffee that it just gave me bad vibes in this as well and there were a number of points where the way that coffee is discussed and the way that Viv is like elevated as this person bringing coffee to others just gave me bad vibes. Overall I did not enjoy this and I also don't think it was particularly well done and I would give this a two out of five stars. The next book on this list is Nona the Ninth which is the third book in the Locked Tomb series. Sure, 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 sure. 
<laughs> we are gonna try. We're gonna try. So the plan is to read Gideon the Ninth today. I have started this book already. I've started multiple times. I've never made it past the first couple of chapters. I know, I know, I've heard people talk about like getting over and just like diving into it. And even if you're not really connecting all of the characters or feeling confused to just keep going, I just have never been motivated to do so, but I have to now. So ideally I would finish Gideon the Ninth today and start Harrow the Ninth, I think, is the second book tonight. And tomorrow morning, I have to take a break from Hugo's reading to read Happy Place by Emily Henry because we have a live show for House Salt tomorrow night. So Happy Place in the morning and then finish Harrow in the night. And then Wednesday, I could read Nona the Ninth. And then the final book on this list that I have to read would be Wednesday night. I could finish off this blog Thursday morning and have it up if you're seeing this. <laughs> Hopefully on time, hopefully for my deadline on Thursday. Uh, no, you got, I, I have got this. Let's go. This is going to be just a quick update. I read Getting the Ninth. I finished it. I took a pause and read Happy Place for the live show, which already happened. I loved Happy Place. And then I started reading Harrow the Ninth. This is such an interesting series to binge. It's really helpful because all of the information is kind of fresh and I'm taking it from book to book. But Harrow specifically, like, is the kind of book that slows you down <laughs> no matter how quickly I wanted to get through it. I was being slowed down by all of the moving parts and all of the questions that I had, the mystery. It's a dense sort of read. So it took me a while to get through that and like halfway through reading it I needed another brain break. So I started The Spare Man. And then finally between last night and this morning I finished Harrow the Ninth. And so that is three books that I have finished over the last couple of days that don't actually take away anything from this TBR that I have. Um, but that leaves me with needing to read Nona the Ninth and finish The Spare Man. I got like 15% of the way through that and it isn't a very long book so I'm not as worried about The Spare Man as I am about Nona. So I'm going to focus most of my energy on Nona today. If I need brain breaks I'll continue with The Spare Man. My real goal is to have Nona done today and the majority of this vlog edited today so that tomorrow I can wake up finish what I need to of The Spare Man, record the last clip, tell you about these last reads, plop it in. Will she get this up by deadline? <laughs> you know, who can say? I feel like I have so many thoughts about Gideon and Harrow right now. I'm going to wait to talk about Nona because that is the one that is nominated for this award, but I already am like thinking about what other content I can make around the series and like my impressions and thoughts of it. And also like thinking about rereading it because I know that I understood like 60% of it by design. I feel like Muir is like trolling us at least half the time. Time. And there are so many pieces that only fall into place once you have information from later on in the book or the series. And so I know rereading it will be really interesting. And this is the kind of series that lends itself well to rereading. So I absolutely see why this series as a whole is one that the fans get really invested into because like my mind's already like whirling and twirling. And even for all of the things that I could say as weaknesses, like that is still happening. I'm still like mysteries, connecting dots. I want to reread this. So it's been really interesting to binge those over the last couple of days. I'm super excited for Nona and I hope that helps me get through it pretty quickly. So that's the quick update. I have these two more books to read. You will see me at least one more time, maybe twice, depending on when I finish Nona today, but that's the plan. I did it. <laughs> We are not in the clear yet because I still have to edit this and export it and upload it, but I did all of my reading. This video will definitely go up today. I'm obviously really happy about that. I'm also incredibly tired and I think I'm gonna like sit down and play The Sims for hours on end after this and start fresh with my September TBR tomorrow. So I finished reading Nona the Ninth and I am having so many feelings about this series and about this as a nomination for the Hugos. Nona the Ninth is the third book in the Locked Tomb series. So plot synopsis are a bit of a spoiler. So I'll tell you what the first book, getting 
in the ninth is about, sort of. <laughs> it's really complicated, but in the first book we follow Gideon, who's serving the ninth house as something of an indentured servant. And while she has plans to make her great escape from this servitude, she is pulled back by the reverend daughter of the ninth house to explain that the emperor has issued a decree to all of the houses to send necromancers to him for a chance to become a lictor, which are his immortal and incredibly powerful servants. Harrow needs Gideon to be her cavalier, basically her right sword hand, and they enter into this agreement that if Gideon does this for Harrow, that when Harrow becomes a lictor, that she will set Gideon free. And that truly is just a starting point. What unravels from there and the scope of everything that we're dealing with only continues to get bigger and bigger. I mentioned in a previous clip that binging this way was actually pretty helpful because this has so many mysteries and so much information and so many ways that Muir is intentionally keeping us in the dark. And so having the information fresh in my head was great from going from book to book. But I think the reading experience of Nona was where I felt the binge the most. And it wasn't that I didn't enjoy it, because I did. But these books all have a very similar structure and they require a huge investment from the reader, especially up front at any book. The first like 100 pages of each of these books feels really heavy in terms of exposition and setting up all of the players and pieces, but in a way that is truly hiding what is actually going on here. And that sort of exposition at the beginning of Nona felt a little more difficult for me to get through than in the other books. Each of these books feels incredibly different because of the narrator and like the narration style of them all. These are books that really employ the unreliable narrator trope or there are limitations to each of our narrator's view of the world and that really goes a long way into why we are only getting certain bits and pieces of the story and that again makes each book feel incredibly different but their structure is very much the same. We get this initial piece of like setting people and players and what we think the story is going to be and then there comes some other like twist or turn mystery or like the reveal of what we are actually here to do and then in the last part we are usually getting the reveal of information that makes all of the pieces click into place. These works are really theme heavy as well and the thematic content in Nona was just so well explored especially around love and family and identity. Identity is so huge here because we're talking about necromancers and this exchange of soul and body and like what makes a person a person. There's also so much about grief here and some of the best lines in the entire thing are describing both grief and love. Even in this third book you either meet or spend more time with characters that you only briefly met in other series and they just immediately became some of my favorites. I think Nona is such an excellent character to have at the head of this like unreliable narrator thing and she gives such a fresh perspective to a world that is really grim. It was great to see things through her viewpoint and to explore like that childlike love. Again, a huge theme here is of love and relationships and family. And because her point of view and voice is very childlike, I think it brings a freshness to that exploration. My critiques of Muir remain the same throughout the three books. And I think that fans will tell you that a lot of the sort of confusion around the book has to do with the mystery and that you have to like sort of sit through it and like put it together and invest the time and the energy to get to the end of it. And I will say that that is true mostly. Like there is a piece here where Muir is intentionally manipulating information and trolling us and like things do become clear towards the end. But I wouldn't put that like 100% on sort of purposeful confusion. I think that there is something about your style that gets a little bit hazy specifically around action and in scenes where we have a large ensemble. She is very verbose in her style. It's very fast and quick witted and that usually works for me. And the times it doesn't is because she's losing the thread and things are starting to fray a little bit in terms of like you the reader being able to follow along with her idea and what she's saying. Ultimately this was a series where that investment did pay off for me in some characters that I really love and a coming together of all of the mysterious parts of this that I find interesting and that I think are a vehicle to explore some themes that I'm really invested in which include not only the ones that I've mentioned but also thoughts about like religion, thoughts about humanity and heroes and devotion and that surprisingly as you read on have a lot to do with like 
us now, the state of the world right now. I gave Gideon the ninth four stars, I gave Hera the ninth four stars, and I would also give Nona the ninth four stars. I also know that like on reread, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy these even more, like I feel that deeply. And I know I will be tempted to bump those ratings up in the future, like having the knowledge going through them, but I think there is something to be said for that experience, the barrier to entry, some of that confusion in Muir's writing that I don't think is entirely purposeful. And the fact that I am a firm believer that even in an interconnected series, in, even in a series that builds, each entry into that series should stand on its own. And these mostly do, mostly. But I think that there are ways that like you could firm up the plot to really make them feel like things that you could enjoy alone. Next up on the list was Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher, which I had already read. This is a story of a princess named Mara, but she's a third born and she ends up going to a convent and basically being raised there. And while she's there, her firstborn sister is married off to a prince of a neighboring country for an alliance. And then she dies. And after her death, her second born sister is also married off to the same prince. And Mara starts to suspect that things aren't well with her second born sister either. She decides that she is going to go and save her sister. And what follows is a quest because she knows that she can't just go and like get her sister from this prince and anything that she does could ruin the relationship between these two nations. So she needs help in order to rescue her sister. I love this so much. <laughs> I think that some of the reasons that it might not land for other people is that this is in fact a quest fantasy. I love quest fantasies, but you really have to be into this idea of just kind of going from place to place for a while and picking up people and tools that you need for the end goal. This did drag a little bit for me in the middle in terms of the pacing because because of like the different stops that we're making. But I was so invested in these characters. I found them all so charming. I thought that every new piece that we picked up was lovely. So I was invested enough. And like I said, I love quest fantasies to begin with. But if you are not a fan of that stop and go pacing that is inherent to a quest fantasy, this might not work for you. Another thing that I really loved about this was the melding of tone here. This has a coziness to it. The vibe is very cozy. The archetypes of the characters that we are using and ultimately their relationships to each other feel very cozy, but the themes that it is exploring are dark. Her sister is in an abusive relationship. We're also sealing her deal with failed pregnancies. There is violence throughout this book. And the fact that those two things are in opposition to each other, I think made this a very unique reading experience. And to me, they acted in balance, right? I could more deal with some of the darkness of the world because I had these companions and their forming relationship and the coziness that went along with that. I really enjoyed Mara as a main character character and I thought that the side characters really shown. There is like a little whiff of a romance in here. I would not go in expecting or wanting a romance from this because honestly their relationship as it forms is not really that at all and all we get is sort of hinted that it could be more especially towards the end of the book but even that like forming friendship even that forming connection was well explored. I also love fairy tales and this had that wonderful fairy tale like atmosphere and and I think that also added to the coziness of this because it felt like a story, like coming home to a kind of story that you've definitely loved and experienced before. And with that added freshness of the darkness of the themes and the tone that I think still made this a unique experience. There was something so earnest and full of heart about this and I really enjoyed it. I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars. And that left me with my last book, which I finished just this morning, and that was The Spare Man by Mary Robinette Kowal. This is an adult sci-fi mystery that follows our main character Tesla Crane. She is an inventor and a billionaire and an heiress. She is traveling incognito because she is rather famous for her honeymoon. She's on a liner that goes between the moon and Mars and her husband is a retired detective. And while they are there, someone is murdered and the on-ship police arrest her husband as their prime suspect. So she is trapped on this liner and she is pulled into this investigation. I would say that this leans like cozy fantasy because we have an amateur sleuth on the case, which is good to keep in mind in terms of whether or not you will enjoy this. And ultimately I did. I had fun with the story. There was like one big issue that I had with it that kept kind of bringing me out of the experience. I liked Tesla as a character for the most part. I loved her 
her relationship with her husband, even though we meet them and they're like already married and in love, there was enough interaction between them and enough showing us the way that they cared for each other that made me feel pulled into and invested in their relationship immediately. The mystery was fun and well paced, had plenty of suspects and turns, not necessarily twists. I think that from like A to where we ended up was rather straightforward. There is something a little bit like over the top and like, I don't know, classic mystery villain Scooby-Doo-ish about the end. But the way that we got there, I wouldn't say is too twisty if that is what you require from a murder mystery, but it did have enough like building revelations that I felt engaged. There are a number of ways that we are like immediately drawn to Tesla, like some shorthand to get us invested in her, which is not like a knock on the story because it worked. And one is that she has the most adorable service dog <laughs> in the story. And again, the way that she cares for the dog, the way that the dog cares for her, the way that everyone interacts with the dog, it just so immediately wins you over as the reader. And then Tessa also is dealing with some PTSD and a disability because of something in her past. So your heart really goes out to her as you see her navigate her day to day. The one thing that I mentioned that sometimes brought me out of the story is in fact that Tesla is like an, a billionaire heiress, right? And I think that this book is aware of that and it often calls out her privilege and the way that Tesla sees the world and how she's like throwing money at her problems all over the place. And so a lot of things get solved that way where she's just like, well, I'm Tesla Crane and here's money. And so that didn't always feel satisfying from a reading perspective point of view. But then also I was just like thinking about this like billionaire heiress, <laughs> you know, like at one point uh, her husband has to pull her aside and she, he's like, I know you don't like to show your privilege, but you're kind of yelling at the help right now. The story was recognizing it, but as a like fault to give to our main character who we're supposed to be invested in, like maybe this is just a bad time for that fault to be you're really rich and have a lot of privilege. So for me personally, it was just something that kept bringing me out of the immersion. But overall, I did enjoy the story. I would give this like a, I think I'm between like a 3.5 and 4 out of 5 stars. I think I probably enjoyed it and thought it was like a 4 star effort. I'm not entirely sure how memorable it would be. Now, I think that transitioning here into sort of a wrap up, Kowal in her acknowledgments also talks about how this was a pandemic book and like how difficult it was for her to write during the pandemic and it put something into focus for me that I don't think I had really thought about with these other books and it's that as these were all published in 2022 many of these authors were writing them in 2020 and 2021 so these are the books that are a product of the pandemic and of the election and the insurrection at least in terms of the election and the insurrection for the American writers but the pandemic was global so this was some of the context that bred this class of nominations, which my first inclination was to like say, and I still think that this is rather true, that I'm a little bit disappointed with this batch overall. I mean, I had a relatively good time, but it didn't feel like, you know, banger after banger, which is kind of what I expect, or at least what I want from like a nomination for an award like the Hugos. And I think it's interesting that this is like kind of what came out of that time. Cozy sci-fi and fantasy is well represented here and these sorts of books that do really feel like they're playing in the sandboxes that are like well known and loved. Keeping that in mind it gives me a better feeling about this crop of nominees overall. I will end by ranking them. At number six is Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. At number five is The Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. At number four is A Spearman by Mary Robinette Kowal. At number three is The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Sylvia Morena Garcia. At number two is Nona the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. And at number one is Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. Now that is strictly by my experience and enjoyment, my read of the quality, my star rating. But if I were to talk about what I wanted to win from this batch, I think Nona the Ninth, to be honest, I don't know if this is me giving credit to Nona for the entire series, which is a thing that happens with awards. But I just think that what Tamsin is doing is so incredible 
incredibly different. It is so layered. It is so thoughtful. It feels like big brain reading. It feels like reading that really pays off. And I would love to see that awarded. And in this batch of nominations, where again, I had a lot of positive experiences, Nona will be the most memorable. Now that said, I would also love to see Sylvia Marina Garcia win, even if it's with a book that wasn't my personal favorite. And that said, I would love to see Teen King Fisher win with Metal and Bone, which I think is a more straightforward story than Nona, but it still does everything that it does incredibly well. I will be very upset if Legends and Lattes wins, and to a lesser extent, <laughs> the Kaiju Preservation Society. I don't really know enough about the Higos to make predictions about what will win, but I will say that I think just based on like name recognition that John Scalzi has a very good chance of winning. We'll see. <laughs> if you have read or would like to read any of the books that I've mentioned, let's chat in the comments, especially if you guys have predictions for what might win and if you have a pick for favorite of what you would like to see win. Thanks for joining me on this really chaotic journey. <laughs> I have to edit this and I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> and if, you know, we do another collaboration in the future, will I have learned my lesson? Who knows? Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you guys soon.